Will it ruin your video if I talk over it? When you think about it, you realise there must be millions of miniature circuit breakers in existence, all quietly doing their job protecting cabling, protecting circuits from the effects of overcurrent, while only dissipating a couple of watts or so in the process. They faithfully do this day and night, and if they do trip, once the fault has been cleared, an MCB will go back to doing its work for a long time to come. So how do they work, and how are they mechanically different depending on the type of MCB? We're going to look at a simple single pole MCB, taking it apart and looking at all of its components, and of course using it outside of its spec to see what happens. If we start off by looking at the outside of our MCB, we have our main toggle switch which effectively isolates and connects the supply. This is the same toggle that drops down in the event of the MCB operating. We've got a little indicator there to tell us whether it's open or closed. The other two main parts on the outside is our screw down terminals. It could be easy with an MCB to end up putting the cable or a bus bar behind that and then you screw that down, you think it's secure and it isn't. This is particularly a problem with the bus bar as you slot an MCB into the DIN rail, you could think it's secured in place, you can't do the tug method on the cable. Another issue is with stranded cables, you could end up in a position where some of the strands end up behind and some of them end up in front of the terminal so you don't end up with a full secure connection. Before we move on, we have a little screw terminal on the top for adjusting a uh, biometallic strip which we will see a little bit later. Having drilled out the pins to our MCB we can now separate the two halves of the clamshell. You'll see here there's a lot of different bits of plastic that all work to hold all of its individual pieces in the correct place within inside it. It's the same on the opposite side of the case too. So we've got our two terminals one of which we'd expect to connect to the bus bar the other one to our cable, then we have our adjustment screw which sets the level of where we expect that biometallic strip to be for its operation. We then have our two contacts of which one is connected to our biometallic strip with a braided copper wire. There's quite a small gap between these contacts but it doesn't take much for this trip device to operate. It's almost on the brink of wanting to flick and disconnect at any one time. But when you've got that biometallic strip, all it takes is for that to bend enough to pull that mechanism over and break that connection, or for the solenoid to push it from above, which kind of shows you how both parts of those mechanisms work in order to flick that contact away from the other one. So once we've broken our connection, we've then got to ensure that that connection is going to stay disconnected. In circuits where we break a connection with high voltage, we can have an arc. This here is part of our arc prevention systems. The arc is encouraged to travel down this path and go through that little device there which breaks up the arc into lots of smaller sections and reduces the temperature of the arc, ultimately extinguishing that arc as it no longer has a path to travel. DC MCBs are set up a little bit different because that arc doesn't break halfway through the cycle. So there we have the basics of our MCB. How about we jump to a cutaway version where we can see this MCB working in practice. I'm going to provide it with some AC loads.
because this current is fairly high the impulse current of the motor it causes that mcb to trip quite fast resulting in the little coil being the part that pushes our connection apart i wasn't able to and i did have a go to try and put a load on it that resulted in the bimetallic strip bending unfortunately i didn't have any resistive loads like a heater to hands that was powerful enough for this i had a low powered oil heater but that wasn't enough current on its own so i've just got to settle for seeing the solenoid activate i did try putting a dc load on of only 12 or 14 volts or so but fairly high current 13 amps and you can see some bending if i do a jump forward and backwards however it just wasn't enough power through that biometallic strip to break it since we're talking biometallic strips, it's quite amazing really when you consider that this is just a three, four pound part and you have a piece of metal in there that has two different materials which bend at different amounts depending on the temperature and result in a current break. I'm imagining that these are welded or maybe brazed together. So that's just one part. You've then got a coil, you've got a solenoid, there's a few springs here. There's a load of metal, there's plastic casing. And when you think about how all of this is put together and packaged, it's quite amazing that we get this for just a few pounds. The wonders of mass manufacturing, hey? Okay, so what if we use one of these devices in a way that's different than what it's supposed to be used? Well, if we put too much current through it, it's the wrong device for us. Maybe we're using a type B breaker when we have motors like we talked of before that need a type C or type D breaker. That's going to result in nuisance tripping. A type C or D MCB might have a slightly less strong magnet or a slightly stronger spring in the solenoid. Or it might have a slightly thicker biometallic strip. It's not very obvious when you look at these, which one of these is the case, unless I had perhaps the same manufacturer and two side by side, but I just don't have those to hand. Another consideration is an MCB's design for AC or DC. In reality, most MCBs are going to be AC rated. That's where we use the most in things like consumer units, but we might want to control a DC motor. So we would have a DC breaker in this situation. Because DC doesn't have the ability to break its arc by itself because of not having that sine wave, it could become quite dangerous if we were to have the wrong MCB, as we'll demonstrate now. So you can see this arc doesn't extinguish. It only extinguishes because I break the connection with the isolator that's after it. The same process goes for not just MCBs, but any sort of connection device that's designed to break a circuit. So maybe relays or isolators. You'll find that they quite often a relay can have a DC rating, but it's often a lot, lot lower than what you'd expect for AC. And it's all down to this breaking the contact. So DC breakers are set up differently. Maybe a larger disconnection point or some other techniques. So it's important to use the correct type. All of this, all these little components that go together that have to be manufactured and put into this little device, then all mount on a DIN rail. It's kind of amazing when you consider just a few pounds for this device that protects the cable in, it protects a property, it protects a building from fire, and they're just pittance in terms of money. Well, there we have it. That is how an MCB works. Now we tend to get a lot of MCBs combined with RCDs and RCBO, so a little bit bigger and they tend to have the two functions in. Shall we tear one of those down next? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe and 
click on this video which YouTube recommends your like.